Hello all and welcome to Wake Up With Marcy. It's time to heal, transform, and be inspired. Welcome to episode two of the two-part series on sexual abuse and healing. Last week we heard how Joe Capozzi was groomed by his abuser and how he found the strength to speak out. Today we will hear how he spoke out, coped, and moved on through his creativity and art. He has made it his mission to help other victims by actively fighting for SOL reform in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York, which is the movement to reduce and eliminate statutes of limitation on childhood sex abuse crimes. Let's help him win the fight for others. I'd like to know and I'd like to share how you finally found the strength to tell your parents and your family and what that was like. Well, it was, uh, there's no good way to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and for me, like I said, I saw that Father Pete took interest in this young boy and I was married at the time but separated and I was just in such a really bad place emotionally. I, suicide was a constant thought in my mind, mm -hmm. and I still had a relationship with this, with this, with Father Pete. He was still a part of our family. I was still pretending like everything was okay, mm -hmm. but I was at a point now that I was now separated from my wife. I was at, I was in a job that I really just didn't care about, mm -hmm. and now I'm seeing this young kid, who will who will I will say. A thousand percent guaranteed he would be become a victim of Father Pete and that combination of things and Father Pete emailing me that day saying oh let's go visit little James you want to go God. visit little James mm -hmm. and it was like in that moment I was like okay I have a reason yeah it's not for me right but for You're little, James. little James I could be a hero yes you know I could do something where people maybe will like me mm-hmm and in that moment, I, e I emailed him back <laughs> and I said, I remember everything you did to me. I said, stay away from me and my family or I will expletive kill you. Mm. And as soon as I sent that email to him, I knew it was a race to, I needed to get to my parents first mm -hmm. because I knew he would be calling them. Mm -hmm. I needed to get to the people. I needed to get to little James's father. Mm -hmm. And I immediately called my parents told them over the phone, which is, you know, a huge regret on my part. Mm -hmm. And then I called uh, James, you the did. father of little James, and I said, listen, I said, I need to tell you that Father How brave of you. I had to do it. Yeah. I had to do it. Because mm -hmm. at this point, it's out. Yeah. As soon as I emailed Father Pete, I knew it was out, and I had to now, this yeah. was a race. Yes. And I contacted my parents, and I contacted... Uh, James and Father Pete later tried to call my parents and I know mm -hmm. Father Pete tried to call James and he did call them and you know he tried to say he said to my 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 father uh, you know I'm really worried about Joe I think he's really uh, he's saying some troubling things mm -hmm. and I knew he was gonna play that play that game right and that I was troubled and Something I was making up stories yes yes but now I was like this manic lunatic who was going to get to anybody mm -hmm. and I started reaching out to newspapers I started like just you know posting stuff online because I needed to get it out yes once you start sharing your truth it there's the healing that happens through that and it's like you can't stop talking about it right well yes there's the there's the good and the bad because I'm also telling anybody okay you know yeah. I'm, I'm online at the supermarket and I'm oh, like you know telling, you, oh, you just tell no. anybody yeah, you tell yeah. you just tell you I was like ah, you know at a bar and I'm yeah. meeting people and I'd be like, oh, I was molested by a priest. You know, you're yeah. telling anybody. Right. And it's like I had finally had some friends who said to me, listen, mm -hmm. not everybody wants to hear it, is ready to hear it. And but but what also was a big part was that I was going to therapy. Yeah. I so start, that's what helped you. I started going to therapy before I even said anything. My wife pretty much gave me an ultimatum like you need to go to therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My ex-wife, you need to go mm -hmm. to therapy. And I was like, all right, all right, you know, I'll do whatever just to try to, you know, save this relationship. Right. 
but you know, it was it was then in therapy as I called my therapist up. He was an- another phone call I made. Was like uh, I was molested by a priest, by the way, mm. and I'm sorry I haven't told you this before. Yeah, and then that began the process of being in therapy, going three times a week, mm-hmm. and for 45 minutes, pretty much just vomiting up this emotional trash, right. this stuff, and you know that's what I tell anybody. Yeah, anybody is therapy, therapy, therapy. Well, you need help. You cannot do this alone. No. You cannot heal, but there is hope. Yeah. And this is why we are sitting here today, is to try to help someone out there that's watching. Well, it's these conversations that we have now that we're able to talk mm-hmm. about it and that we are emotionally controlled, mm-hmm. which I think then helps other people to listen more. Yes. You know, uh, I came forward in 2005, and, mm-hmm. and in 2005, there wasn't that much conversation about this going on. No. We didn't know about triggering and grooming and, um, you know, the issues now that are popping up, obviously, with the Catholic Church, but it's not just the church. You know, someone like Bill Cosby, yes. you know, some of these, these predators that are out there, Jerry Sandusky in Penn State, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Larry Nasser, the doctor, the gymnastics doctor, you know, all of these people where it's, it's not just... And these just, are only the big high profile people. Yeah. So this happens all the time. It yes. happens all the time. And, you know... I believe it's every 98 seconds there's a child sexually molested. One in four girls, one in six boys are sexually abused before they turn 18. Mm. And so conversations like this are so important because we know that we're going to reach one person. And if mm-hmm. we reach that one person and give them a sense of relief and understanding, then, then we're doing what, what, we're, what, what we should be doing in Absolutely. terms of taking our pain and our shame mm-hmm. and making it into something good. It's like what I say. It's like I, try, I wanted to try to make something good out of the mess. Yes, absolutely, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing today. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, when we come back, we will hear more from Joe and his accomplishments to this date. Welcome back to Wake Up With Marcy. So I want to talk about life today. So you have a family, you have a son. So let's talk a little bit about that. How is that for you? Well, I I never thought I would have a kid. Mm -hmm. Uh, From my experience, I was like, I don't want to bring up a kid in this world. Mm -hmm. So the last thing I have, if I can't protect myself, how am I going to protect a child? Mm -hmm. But I do. I have a two-year-old son, Gavin, Mm -hmm. and I'm married, and I'm lucky, incredibly lucky. And I see him, and I always pay attention to him, especially when he meets adults for the first time. Yeah. Because like I've said to so many people, my initial gut reaction at seven or eight years old, Mm -hmm. you know, kids are so pure. They are. Kids, they know good. They know evil. Yes. And so with him, you know, whenever I, I, I'm teaching him, you know, hand, handshakes are good. Yeah. You know, you don't have to hug everybody who, you know, who you meet because Mm -hmm. everybody wants to hug a cute little two year old. And, you know, so a couple times I've seen him put his hand out initially. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, he's listening to dad. Yeah. And I'm just, you know, it's 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 I want him to be, you know, a strong, Mm -hmm. loving, um, empathetic Mm -hmm. and compassionate person who's not afraid of the world. Yeah. I, I myself am married now and have two children. And I remember when they were first born, and especially my daughter, I, I was very fearful and very protective, and even of my husband. And it was just that innate fear from when I was little and just making sure to protect. But I've healed as you have healed, and now raising these, these beautiful children, yeah. right? That, that it is possible. Um, and one of the things I just want to mention is that you said you hated yourself and I said that too, but once I learned how to love myself, I was able to let others love me and I knew how to love back because that's what I lost. I didn't know how to really love. I didn't know what love looked like. Um, and I just thought of myself as. I don't know, just a shell of a person. And one of the things that you've said that really touched me is that sexual abuse takes a child's soul. 
and it really does. I mean, I always felt that it took that little girl, she was gone. And um, so I'd love to just a little bit, when you say it takes your soul, what, what does that mean to you? Well, there's a term called uh, soul murder, mm -hmm. where you're murdering the soul of someone uh, that abusers, predators, once they start to physically act and emotionally act on, on you know, their victim, mm -hmm. that they're murdering the soul of that child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for me, it was I felt stuck. I felt frozen as this young kid. Yeah. And again, not understanding fully the impact of it until later. It's one of those things where it's like you really, um, you know, how do we quantify the damage done? You know, yeah. but th that term soul murder is to me is appropriate because you really do, you know, it wreaks such ha havoc and it re re wreaks such pain on, on, on a kid. Right. So, you know, that but we know that. But you're rebuilding your soul yes. right now and you're doing that through your art and your creativity. That's so, what saved me. Yeah. So know? let's talk about that. You have some amazing projects that you have done um, and you're telling your story through them. So your first one was for Pete's sake. Right. So let's a, talk about that. First one was for Pete's sake. It was a play that I wrote. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was an actor. I am an actor. I studied acting. Um, you know, that was to do something with my sensitivity and my mm -hmm. creativity. I started to take acting classes. And I had a teacher who, when I came forward about my story, uh, my teacher said to me, uh, the late George DiCenzo, great, great man. Mm -hmm. He said to me, Write, start writing about it. And I'm like, but I'm not a writer. He's like, everybody could be a writer. Mm -hmm. And I started to write about my experience, but I needed to do it in a way which for me was humor was a big part of mm -hmm. what got me through. Mm -hmm. So I started working on this piece in acting class. And as I started writing more and more, and I had this great group of friends in acting class who then you know, I wrote this play and we had a reading of it and I said to my friends, I go, do you think there's anything here? And they're like, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're like, this is funny and it's talking about such a heavy topic. Mm -hmm. So we did it. I put up a stage reading of it in 2008 in December in New York City and, mm -hmm. you know, in a room full of, you know, 120 people at this little theater on the, yeah. on the Lower East Side. And it was amazing. It must have felt so good. It felt great. Yeah. And that's actually who I met. My wife was mm -hmm. in the audience that day. Oh, she was. And that's how I met her. How incredible. Right. Yeah. So here I was, someone who That brought you to your wife. Yeah. Yeah. And someone who kept so many secrets. Mm -hmm. I'm standing in front of these people, you know, saying everything. Yes. And, and just really coming clean about this, this dirty secret. Yeah. And from that point on you know, meeting my wife, but then doing the play, and we had a great off-Broadway run of it, and I put this, we presented this play up in Boston, and in churches in New York, and in churches in, in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and I was in the play, yeah. and it was a great cathartic feeling and process until it wasn't anymore, mm -hmm. until it just became a little too much. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do, though, is I wanted to create some kind of healing tool, as I call it, um, and I, I wanted to make a short film, mm -hmm. a 15 minute short film that would take you inside the mind of a sexual abuse survivor. And that's what was the next thing was confession mm -hmm. that my wife directed. Wow. wow. And that now we've put out into the world for anybody to see. And I wanted, I wanted it just to be out there for anybody to see both survivors and friends and family of who get a sense of, you know, uh, what it's like the impact of, and you know, it's been amazing just to kind of see people, hear from people from Australia, from France, from Germany, from around the world. Making a difference, yes, yeah. absolutely. And yeah. if someone wanted to see that, so they could go on YouTube or? They could go on Vimeo. And Vimeo. It's, you know, through my wife's production company uh, that I do work for, Star Films, mm -hmm. we have everything posted there. And, okay. you know, and now it's led me to, you know, 
producing this documentary. You have a documentary, called, yes, which is pretty impressive. Yeah, the documentary is called A Peloton of One, mm -hmm. and it's about um, an abuse survivor from New Jersey, Dave O. Muller, mm -hmm. who wanted to ride his bike from Chicago, where he lives now, to yeah. Montclair, New Jersey, where he was abused. Mm -hmm. And we shot that in October mm -hmm. with an incredible crew of guys, and yeah. we, we were on the road for two and a half weeks, and what Dave, what we did was Dave wanted to ride his bike, mm -hmm. but what we wanted to do was stop along the way mm -hmm. in certain uh, towns where the issue is really, really prominent. And we met with advocates, we met with survivors, we met with state representatives. And how did you find them? Social media. Yeah. Social media has been there's the there's the bad part of social media, and mm -hmm. then there's the great supportive yeah. part of social media Absolutely. where. I have this incredible group of survivors, you know, that we have reached out all around the world, but through social media, I was able to cast this documentary. Yeah. And, you know, from a 15-year-old survivor advocate, a kid at 15 mm. who is sharing his story and helping so many mm. to, you know, to what I, who I like to bring up is state senator from New Jersey, uh, Senator Joe Vitale. Mm -hmm. and we got to interview him and he's been the leading voice for survivors in New Jersey to change the statute of limitations on sexual assault and sexual abuse crimes. I know you're working hard to to make that change. And, it's huge. And push it. It's huge. So, so how are you making the change and how can we help? Well, Every state has their own statute of limitations on sexual assault and sexual abuse cases. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, the, it's, it's the expiration date on a crime. Mm -hmm. So with sexual assault and sexual abuse, a lot of times the expiration date is three to five years from either from when you turn 18. And we now know that most survivors do not come forward until 20, 30 years later. And yes. those laws need to be changed and we need to remove the statute of limitations on those laws because all those laws, those, those SOLs are protecting, they're protecting the predators yes. and they're protecting the institutions mm -hmm. that cover up for them mm -hmm. or that are so fearful of them, of there being a so-called run on the money yeah. because everybody's going to come forward. But, you know, know, your, know the SOLs in your state. When we come back, we will hear more from Joe and his healing from his abuse. Welcome back to Wake Up With Marcy. So is there a petition or sending letters or how can you Call your, make a difference? It's one of those things where you think, you know, I had people say to me, oh, you, you can't make a difference. Yes, you can. All you do is you either email or, or call your state mm -hmm. representative. Okay. Google it, find out who that person is mm -hmm. and let them know, ask, your state representative, where do you stand on this issue? Mm -hmm. And for many of them that are blocking justice, they receive a lot of money from insurance lobbies and the church and the Boy Scouts and other big institutions that mm -hmm. are so fearful of this S of the SOL being removed mm -hmm. that they are fighting with millions and millions of dollars to protect themselves but what they're really doing is they're protecting the predator they are because the predators the know predator. this yes they know that oh I have you yeah. know this kid's not gonna be able to do anything about it in 10 years because the right. crime will be expired exactly so exactly. that for me is and I, I am you know for me to say the, use the word hope mm -hmm. when it comes to this stuff I have incredible amount of hope mm -hmm. because of the dialogue that's happening now and that state representatives are understanding the impact and they now know that you know what maybe I'm not going to take this ten thousand dollars from this insurance lobby group because I would rather protect the children of my um, of my county as That's opposed incredible. to protect the institution yes absolutely yeah let's do our part to make a difference please just call I mean just it's call. it's really just make mm -hmm. your voice heard it's and you know there's also especially with clergy abuse, there are hotlines that every state is opening up. And in New Jersey, you know, I called the hotline, the clergy abuse hotline. And a month later, I was sitting with a Hudson County detective giving my sworn statement under oath, mm -hmm. which is what I always wanted to yeah. be able to swear under oath that this happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I was able to give my story and make my, my story and my voice count towards. You really had a voice at that yeah. time. The yeah. voice that you lost for so many years. 
So I wanted to go back to your documentary because I know that you are still raising money yeah. and need to finish the film. Yeah. And with you finishing the film, if there is help out there, if we can raise the money to finish um, that film, yeah. what are you gonna do with it? Oh, this will be a film that, I mean, obviously another teaching tool, another healing tool, but it's a film that I feel it tells a story of hope. Mm -hmm. It tells a story of healing, and it tells a story of um, understanding. And, you know, we are, we are raising, we are, post-production is on hold. We need $25,000 to edit this thing, but we have an incredible amount of footage, and we have a GoFundMe that's, that's up, and, um, you know. And what's the GoFundMe under? It's under Dave Olmuller, but if you uh, Google a Peloton of one, uh, you know, between our Instagram and our Facebook and, and all that other good social media stuff. I mean, we, it's going to get done. Mm -hmm. We are at a point where the timing couldn't be any better. And it's um, myself along with my co-producer, John Bernardo, and our director, Steve Mallorca. I mean, I, I was so blessed. We were so blessed with this crew of people who put yeah. this documentary together that yeah. I can't wait for it to be done. Uh I have no doubt it's going to be going to be an amazing piece, and I just want to say thank you so much for coming on Wake Up, <laughs> having this open discussion, helping to make a difference for somebody else, and, and I know it's hard. I know it's hard, but you're doing amazing things, and I, this is why I'm doing this, because with us finding our voice, we're going to help somebody else find theirs. Oh, for sure. So thank you so much again for coming on Wake Up. Thanks. I wanted to share a story of inspiration with you all. Recently had the opportunity to go to Marival, which is in Arizona, and do some real soul healing. I used to say I was a victim of sexual, physical, and mental abuse, but now I can say I'm a survivor. I had to dig deep to forgive those that abused me in my past, but once I did that, I was able to forgive myself. My past did form the person I was a woman with band-aids on my wounds and making choices that did not serve me. I've had to learn to respect myself and expect it from others and to know I'm worthy to really set boundaries. Healing is not easy, but if you wanna pull yourself from the wreckage of the past, it is necessary. I can honestly say I am now full of joy and I know that my past does not define me. I now can truly love myself, and I encourage you to do the same. You are definitely worth it. Today was an incredibly powerful show. As you can see, it is possible to heal and move forward. May you find your voice and strength through our stories. I wanted to share a final thought that I shared earlier. Every 98 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Just know that you are not alone. I want to thank you for tuning in today. And remember, be kind and be happy.